I would like uh, to welcome once again all of you to the Guide Our Forum and our discussion. My name is uh, Maria Shkleruk and uh, I'm uh, academic director of the Center of uh, Digital Transformation Chiefs uh, Training of uh, RANAPA. Our center, first of all, deals with uh, training civil servants and I can see graduates of our program. So, training uh, on matters connected uh, with digital transformation and uh, we incorporate digital block uh, to our education that is always challenging that's why that's why early last year one of the tasks uh, that we posed to ourselves uh, was uh, the question whether we can uh, have a more systematic approach to ethical questions and to start a new year with a large discussion on ethical questions, ethical matters, to discuss uh, how digital technologies uh, change uh, some uh, things that uh, we are accustomed to, or pose uh, some ethical questions uh, as a cornerstone. So we believe uh, that uh, a pragmatic approach uh, to ethics uh, can allow avoid uh, extremes either to allow it all or to forbid it all and we would like to discuss uh, today ethical questions uh, in uh, a good way in uh, a multifaceted uh, way and uh, starting last year we said that uh, 2019 would be a year to discuss uh, platform solutions, uh, digital platforms, and uh, how the civil service will uh, change in the digital. Now we believe that 2020 will be the year to discuss ethical questions. Because it's uh, great to prepare for the cases that will turn up. I will now introduce the speakers uh, to you so that uh, you can uh, remember their names to ask uh, them questions to see their stance on this or that matter. So I will present our report and I will give you links uh, on the publication of our report uh, connected uh, with uh, ethical questions. And Lily Zemnikova is a research fellow at the STS Center, associate professor at the Department of Sociology and Philosophy at the European University at St. Petersburg. She is one of the co-authors. So could you tell us what happens with ethics uh, in line with technology development? Good uh, morning. I was asked uh, to be brief, uh, so I will say that uh, ethical uh, matters uh, are becoming more and more crucial and we have to strike uh, solutions that uh, will be guidelines uh, for future operations, uh, for future development of digital technologies. Maria has said that 2020 might be the year of ethics. Yes, well, it has started already. But as for the industry, 2018 uh, in uh, IT was the year of ethical uh, matters uh, in development because inside larger corporations, that was the year when ethical committees and commissions uh, turned up. They all face difficulties uh, now in their operations because they cannot uh, find a, a solution that would satisfy everyone. And everybody agrees that ethical questions and matters are ones of the most complicated. The second one is responsibility sharing, because it is not always clear who will be responsible for what in case of incidents that algorithms will drive us at. And uh, the third aspect is connected with that, uh, that is uh, case law and regulation. And uh, ethical uh, regulations that uh, uh, turn up uh, in these or those uh, situations uh, can be rewritten, uh, reconsidered, and uh, it uh, will uh, be a long process. Uh,
I wonder when uh, lawyers uh, will come back to that. And uh, in a session parallel to us, uh, our colleagues uh, argue how to regulate digital technologies for them to develop successfully. The next uh, participant of our discussion is Valery Karpov, head of the Department of Neurocognitive Sciences and Intelligence Systems at the Kurchatov Research Center, vice president of the Russian Association of Artificial Intelligence. A question to you, Valery. Why do those who develop and apply AI technologies have to think about ethical activities? Good morning, and thank you, first of all, for the invitation. I cannot say that they have to think about that. When we talk about ethics, uh, very often we imply a different thing from what it should be. So the issue is that ethics is uh, a pretty comprehensive thing. There is professional ethics, uh, there are ethical matters uh, connected with these or those technologies application and uh, threats uh, and the consequences of digital technologies application uh, are not different between biomedicine or nanotechnologies and there is nothing special or interesting here. But the point is that when we talk about ethical aspects of uh, intellectual systems that I am first of all most interested in. We have to understand that that is where specificity arises. We have to discuss the issues of ethical behavior of the systems themselves. That is the most interesting thing. And how well the ethical behavior principles are formalized in these systems is important and how far they can be formalized. And uh, we have to not simply think about it, we have to work on that. That is a technical aspect. How can we apply the ethical behavior principles? So from general discussions on this topic, in terms of uh, technical and uh, AI things, uh, the situation is that it's uh, high time that we started working and implementing these systems, not discussing. Thank you very much. I like uh, the approach and uh, I would like it to develop in 2020. That is, we have to stop talking and start acting. I believe that is an important motto for many things uh, that uh, are happening in digital technology sphere. But on the other hand, I will ask a question to Pavel Golosov, the Dean of the School of Information Technology and Data Analysis of RUNAPAR. He works a lot with our center on information security matters and training our students on information security. So, Pavel, the question to you is as follows. What we now call throughput technologies or promising IT, or end-to-end -end, uh, IT are already at the stage of uh, implementation. And, uh, for example, last year, cards on robotics and sensorics uh, were developed, uh, and practically everywhere there are certain ethical issues uh, that appear now or at the level of uh, implementation. So do you think uh, we need to slow down at this stage to think whether we need these uh, issues when we implement uh, IT. Should we slow down, have a look, and only then decide? Thank you for your question, Maria, and thank you for the introduction. I believe that if uh, we could control the speed uh, of uh, scientific and technical progress uh, and agree that uh, we all, the whole world, will slow down to think and uh, to make uh, a well-balanced uh, decision, it uh, would have been great. But regrettably, the trends uh, that uh, we can see today in technologies show that uh, the business that drives uh, technological development is interest are interested in business. And business uh, is uh, very often negligent uh, to security. And in this sense, uh, Technological ethics uh, goes uh, to the background very often. 
So on the one hand, uh, technologies and communications give us new opportunities, but on the other hand, technologies and techniques uh, penetration into the life of people seemingly allow more risks and uh, does not always ask uh, the approval of uh, the human being on, for example, information alienation or anything else that uh, puts uh, that human being at risk. Actually, last year, we tried to discuss this question at the forum with the Ministry of Justice, whether it is time to introduce uh, such a notion as a technical individual in line with uh, physical individual and legal entity, because uh, we some countries start thinking about ethical behavior of robots, but Ministry of Justice was not ready to discuss that last year, so we might uh, try this discussion and maybe some actions with them this year. What else I would like to say is that sometimes uh, we forget about ethics uh, in gaming, because uh, everything connected with gaming and uh, virtual uh, space uh, and uh, games and physical world uh, combination does not have any description of uh, behavioral ethics and uh, the way the person behaves there is not regulated or controlled by anything i don't know whether there is any formula that uh, can take offline ethics into online ethics so briefly that is like this and i have a question uh, proceeding from uh, your words. Yesterday I had an ethical question in the virtual space. I play FIFA. That uh, is competition with the uh, online players, uh, among others. And there are some uh, tasks that you have to do every day to get points. And you had to score a goal uh, in a complex uh, mode of the game. And uh, I was thinking whether it would be ethical if we had a um, chat uh, to agree with uh, my competitor that uh, we will act like this and that uh, here to get the, uh, these uh, points, to get these scores. It uh, might be sports uh, ethics, uh, but still we could not solve uh, this question without this chat. But that is an easiest example. And uh, yesterday I caught myself uh, thinking that, uh, yes, uh, that is a question. Even if uh, you do not have a chat, uh, you can uh, become a streamer and agree with uh, some of uh, the followers uh, there, with some of the subscribers. OK, my next question and the next uh, participant of our discussion is uh, Ilya Dimitrov, founder and executive director of the Salden Group. Ilya, you interact with uh, the government and with business, and I have a pretty practical question to you. Have you faced uh, cases when Russian digital business approached you with uh, issues of ethical character? Thank you very much for your question, and thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, session. Actually, the question you have uh, asked me can be answered easily. All the, all the current uh, questions uh, that are asked uh, in terms of ethics uh, proceed from the current world that we live in and are connected with it. If we have a wider look at it, uh, incorporating the future world, it might seem that uh, current ethical issues discussion is so far not really interesting and not so promising on an easy reason. First and foremost, we all have to have uh, a common uh, environment in this image of uh, the future world. That is how you see the future world in 2030 and so on. And the absence of uh, common integrated view of the world does not allow us uh, to discuss uh, what will be ethical and what will be not uh, ethical in this world. And uh, another thing is uh, cyber physical matters. Uh, that is when uh, cyber and uh, physical uh, things uh, come together. But we also can have uh, 
an even broader look from the point of view of philosophy. There is physical philosophy and, uh, so to say, a, a mindful philosophy, but we do not have cyber philosophy. So, first of all, we have to describe this uh, future new world uh, from the standpoint of philosophers and only then discuss what rules, regulations and ethics we will have there and how it will be combined with the current world. Otherwise, these discussions, well, they are in need, but they are like, uh, for example, you have a cart or a trolley, and uh, we start, which trolley do you mean? The cart with uh, the horses, uh, the coach with the horses, yes. So you discuss the rules uh, that uh, this uh, coach with the horses will ride by in the air. How come? It really sounds funny. So first we need to have a look at it from the point of view of uh, philosophy, because the discussion of this cyber-physical world in 2030, I believe that is a more foundation philosophical uh, question. And my last point, th there are current uh, rules and regulations uh, in terms of ethics, uh, but for different people they are different. For example, uh, I was in uh, Papua New Guinea and uh, they ate a human being 20 years ago and uh, it was uh, ethically okay for them because uh, their ancestors uh, all did so. So our ethics uh, is different and uh, our ethical rules uh, will be different as well. Even now, today, we can see that some social media allow some things and forbid others. In others, it is different. So, so far, there are more questions than answers. It's a good message for right now. Now we're trying to have our speaker. You know, it's a coincidence that among all speakers who have managed to be here on time, there is a futurologist. This is not a profession, but a self-identity. So Kirill Ignatiev is the chairman of the board of directors, Russian investment group of companies. And I'm going to ask this same brief question, the world in 40 years. And the ethical questions. You know, I'd like to continue the idea which has mentioned or been mentioned already that the world is multifaceted and it's going to become more multifaceted thanks to the technologies achieving a new level. Due to that, I do believe that the state is going to be customized. Regulation is going to join the state as it is going to be governed not only by the state, by the administrator, different levels, different units of the social network. Media, the society, the role of the state as a regulator is going to cease to be monopoly in 40 years' perspective. In view of ethics, we're also going to see a very interesting set of things, which are about ethics and regulations. The question, what is ethical and what is not? A couple of vivid examples from the image of the future, which we can forecast today, since part of technologies can be forecast, the technologies are developing just higher, faster and stronger. But the most difficult foresight is related to the connection of these technologies to a person, as there are many different, very complicated issues. There are some concrete examples. Just take a look. You've mentioned uh, computer games. Right now, a common space is the gamification abuse is not kind of ethical stuff. On the other hand, there are some points, ethically shaped points, which is good for a person who is really careful about the healthy lifestyle. In the future, there can be some statements and regulation. There are going to be taxation of people or nicks in the internet. 
which spent a lot of time in computer games, spend their whole life, or those who are not engaged in their health developments, who don't have medical checkups, who is, doesn't care about healthy lifestyle, who is engaged into smoking. It's going to be digitalized when it will be possible. And the regulation of ethical norms is possible. And the second thing I'd like to mention is about the following. In fact, Ilya has mentioned it already. All people are different, and ethical approaches are different. He gave an example of Papua New Guinea, and I'm going to tell you a little bit something what is close to us. We provided for the light detector in the cell phone. You just point at a person, and through your eye, it can give you red or green light, whether you're talking truth or not. How do people relate to that? What is the people's attitude of different ages to that? X generation in analog economy say that if instantly you can check whether the person is telling a lie or truth, this is a deep intrusion into my private life. I don't want to see that. I don't want to have an application like that. I don't want to be used like that in my everyday life. And what absolutely overwhelming statement of the X generation, the representative of 15, 16, 17 uh, years old generation answered in different way. There was a different opinion. If it happens, it's great for the world, as the world is going to be fair. So we are for, we're going to instill this application. These are two different types of ethics. I believe that this diversity of ethical values and principles are going to be very important and major feature of the changing world in changing technologies. Thank you very much for your opinion. I'm not sure about the game abuse. You know, I have kind of a balance. In the morning I have a healthy lifestyle, in the evening I have uh, games to play. Dear colleagues, can you allow those who are standing in the line. We're going to have a speaker going through all of you, so please uh, clarify whether let's be respectful to each other. We have some empty seats. Please let let the people go. We are discussing ethics, so it is quite ethical to allow the people to take the empty, vacant seats, not to stand in the staircase. You know, if such an accident didn't occur, we should have created it. Dear colleagues, could you fall that way? You can just uh, go down. There isn't some equipment in the way. Alexey, all the round of applause not to you. Since we have managed One person at least. Can we look into the situation? It is very complicated in terms of methodology and algorithm. What happened actually? There are many. There is a huge number of people, and there is a lady who felt difficult to stand up. But what actually happened? Unfortunately, the crowd was more important then a lady. So the question is, what was the solution for the machine to take? Is it Black, um, Black Mirror episode number one? This is the answer to your question. Thank you so much to meeting us halfway. This is a good example. I'd like to introduce another 
Speaker Alexey Gorodtsov, Director for the Department of the E-Government Development, Ministry of Digital Development, Communication and Mass Media of the Russian Federation. I just looked at the whole statement. The Department of E-Government Development, the Ministry for Digital Development. So this is digit uh, to the power of two, maybe to the power of three. Yep. Last year we talked much about the uh, e-government. What are the ethical dilemmas? The current state governance faces nowadays. I'll try to be brief. I haven't listened to Lia. Maybe I'm going to reiterate some points. State governments can be separated into two parts. Uh, for the people, mm, done by the people. There is a result, the external result, and something that is internal. And ethical dilemmas exist in both areas. Externally, there is a dilemma, very fast development of technologies. Therefore, everyone moved to digitalization. There is mentality, there is common sense. There's supposed to be different channels. This is in terms of people. And there is a big question whether people are going to believe in solutions made by the machines. Machine is better. You cannot just uh, trade off with the machine. It's going to make a mistake. It's going to be faster decision making. But people believe that the machines can be adjusted, can be intruded, actually. And the second side of the coin of the digitalization. These are the officials from the government. Right now, there is a dilemma. There are many processes which can be automated. People can be given up. Yeah, we can just be kicked out on the street. Uh, jobs are going to disappear. There is nothing to do anymore. But this is not true, actually. It should be dealt with the fear of replacement, the fear of retraining and trusting in machine decision making. This is a long way to cover. You cannot just fulfill it instantly. You should spend some time on that. Thank you very much. Very interesting discussion about the trust in machines, whether it's going to be higher compared with the trust in government. Tomorrow we're going to have a discussion about the trust in public institutions at the same time at the Gaydar Forum. You know, kind of prerequisite for our discussion was a report published by us. I believe some of the participants of our discussion have already managed to look at the report. I'm going to introduce major f points of the report and then we are going to have the discussion about the report from the cases which we have. You can see the link to the report is going to give you the interactive online version which can be accessible in PDF. It is a big one. There are some analytical materials which can be accessed in brief. At the end of my presentation, I'm going to give you a link to this analytical material. In general, I do hope that you're going to be the first to see it. I'd like to thank all the authors participating in the development of the report. More than 20 people joined collaboration to develop the report. The objective of the report is to define those problems connected with ethics which are more relevant for the society, for the state governance, and to demonstrate major approaches to the solving. Sometimes they are kind of competitive, so the report doesn't give you an answer whether you should act in this or that way, but it shows different approaches, different options which are apply today. In our report, we looked into major areas where ethical problems emerge. Data issues, 
artificial intelligence issues and the attitude of citizens. Next slide, please. What is the problem connected with data? The point is that the state cannot catch up with the control and protection of the data. We do have the uh, law on the protection of personal data, strict uh, regulation, which is very difficult to comply with. But we know that the big business, large corporations, are generating data ownership of data at very fast pace. And data, instead of service, you cannot get the service if you do not sign terms uh, and conditions of these big number of terms you allow them to do with your data whatever they want. So the point is that the business starts to use this data as they see fit. Everyone just uh, talk the cell phone, I use the internet. You know, it, I talked about FIFA and now I'm going to have a targeted uh, advertisement and targeted commercials about the FIFA even though I didn't input in my search engine. It's uh, happening everywhere. In general, it leads to the following situation. It leads to the violation of privacy rights, to the equal access to the services, a quite well-known story when many goods and services from iPhone are going to be more expensive compared with the access through Android. There is so-called customization. And the authors we believe that the ethics of working with data is going to be a threshold whether the trust should exist, even among those people who didn't think about that. The second big area is connected with artificial intelligence. It's going to process data. There is no data. There is no opportunity to apply the artificial intelligence. And there is a thing what Lilia talked about. Who's responsible for that? This is the first question asked by the officials. What algorithms, for example, who is going to be responsible for the counterfeit product going through the customs clearance? Who is to blame for? Who is to charge with? If, for example, the allowance, the welfare allowance is given to the wrong person, now we can have the official to blame for. But how can you bring artificial intelligence to account? The second question is, what Alexei has mentioned already, how the transparent the algorithm is, if people can understand how the decision is made. Uh, th there is a number of self-learning neural network, and it is almost impossible to follow the transparency of these outcomes. How to avoid a biased approach? There are many cases. There are many discussions about the legal system, the judicial system. We have some surveys. People say that people trust in robot judges more than in people judges. But if we train neural network based on the awards and decisions right now, we're going to have the same, but instantly. It's not going to increase the trust. It doesn't make any sense to be based on the previous values and previous cases. And there is a question connected with the state governance. Who is going to pay for the mistake? Who is going to suffer? The most vulnerable groups are going to suffer, the elderly, those who live in the rare areas, rural areas, who have lower digital literacy or who lack digital literacy at all, who cannot protect their rights. It's the big expenses connected with the lawsuit to be made. And those poor citizens through scoring models, when it is more difficult to get a loan from the bank, if you have a particular set of features in your scoring model, in the scoring profile. On the other hand, another feature, what Ilya and Kiryu have mentioned already, going to be more taxes to better understand who should be taxed. But I'm not going to reduce their social responsibility. We can see the situation, find ourselves in the situation. And there are many 
questions of data processing and the integration of digital platforms. We all use Uber, Yandex, many use delivery, food delivery applications, particularly Moscovite. So it is provided for by the people who work in almost in slavery. You need to spend 10 to 12 hours driving a car. The courier spent 10 or 12 hours in the street in bad weather conditions. And I have read the article, we should compare it with kind of modern slavery. The technological platforms segregated the layers of the societies. We get used to paying less. So those who, on the other hand, just earn less as well, are going to have a kind of uh, social division. This is a big question to answer. May I have the next slide, please? We summarized in brief what the experts and the people who study this subject call the questions connected with the pervasiveness, uh, the problems connected with the identity. You don't know whether you are being watched or not the unpredicted behavior if you, for example, enter the airport building in Europe, there is CCTV camera going on. And if you, for example, find yourself in China or in Singapore, there, there are no any warnings as everything actually is provided for CCTV cameras. And by default, you are being watched in Moscow. By default, you are under watch. So that's the level of automation. And we don't have any warnings to that. There are many cases of buying something in the black market. We can see all the routes. This is a new question connected with the security and with the pattern of your behavior. May I have the next slide, please? Face recognition systems and what is happening to that. In this regard, we have three main conclusions. We give our data without consent with the possible uh, total control over us. So in, in China, that was the case. And we just agreed to that. We need to be very decent. In Moscow, I cannot accept this idea, but I try to be still decent after China. But nevertheless, I'd like to have more freedom, the algorithms of recognition, if there are some mistakes, so the people suffer, those who are unlucky. You know, this is a problem of developers. I had a case when the tech service uh, is going to solve a problem. You find yourself in a digital red tape. Now we switch you to a different channel. Now you just switch to the system number four, and everything is uh, digital. But it's the case with the uh, real public uh, red tape. You can may make some scandal there, but here it's not the way out. So the question of this big brother, so to say, becomes uh, topical again. And uh, those uh, who have not yet had time, uh, I will give you a chance to have a look at the report. And uh, now I would like to start a discussion. So should we slow down, wait, uh, and uh, learn uh, the mistakes of somebody else, uh, or move fast, not lose time? If not us today, then somebody else will do something of it uh, instead of us uh, tomorrow. Will uh, that person be as caring as us or not? Yes, there are examples of successful introduction of digital technologies when there are new things, uh, like, for example, we have an ombudsman on uh, these matters, and in other countries uh, there are civil servants on uh, privacy in uh, working with algorithms, and uh, they discuss a lot of uh, matters connected with ethics in digital technology, and there are a lot of documents uh, connected with equal access uh, to digital technologies, uh, to the Internet. Uh, so. Anyhow, the tasks that we have is to hear, understand, and start agreeing on common goals and uh, targets. And now getting at our discussion, the first question.
The first question is something I would like to ask to one of the authors of the report, Valery Karpov, is as follows. Working on this report, we saw a case uh, of how the Chinese uh, incentivize uh, kids to study. There is a device uh, that uh, traces uh, the activity of the brain and uh, when uh, the uh, person uh, becomes uh, disorient disoriented, uh, the device uh, gives a signal that uh, the person is distracted, uh, not focused, non-concentrated. So that seems to be great, but that uh, is not simply infringing on the private space of the child, but infringing on the physical, even essence of the child. How ethical this penetration and infringement is, and how can we decide what is good, what is bad? First of all, it seems to me that uh, that is uh, not uh, a really sound technology because all the data that uh, see the activity of the brain show the different opposite thing that uh, the most activity of the brain shows during uh, sleep. So it's not really clear what the Chinese uh, came up with. And if we answer uh, this question, well, that is uh, a nonsense example, because uh, what does ethics have to do with it? We have to understand that ethics uh, is a way of settling a conflict uh, between entities or between people if we say that ethics is first and foremost about uh, people. So here it has nothing to do with uh, ethics. And talking about penetrations, more interesting examples are developments uh, that combine research of a brain, functional MRT, with a polygraph. So when you have uh, sensors uh, that determine whether you say true or lie and uh, what it is combined with MRT readings uh, that gives uh, interesting deliverables but it has again nothing to do with ethics and uh, with good or evil because uh, that is far away from it so I don't think that that is a good example thank you very much actually just these uh, experiments are something that uh, we have in this country as well, but not uh, with the kids. There are educational uh, programs uh, when uh, certain sensors are attached to, to people and uh, then some conclusions uh, are driven from the readings. And uh, the question that I always have is uh, whether that is uh, allowable. I agree that uh, when we use uh, MRT and uh, more cutting-edge uh, technologies, uh, what your institute uh, does, uh, happily not uh, only with people, but with the lower species as well. So you as a scholar, as a person who deals with it, how do you see the border that you will not cross? Is there a border of uh, some experiment connected with the technologies that you thought about, but then told yourself that you will not uh, do that. If uh, a scholar, a scientist, uh, start thinking about that, then uh, he's worth uh, nothing. Uh, because uh, if uh, a person thinks, uh, I will do that, but uh, ethically I cannot do it, that is just uh, self-lying. So you do not have this border. No, I don't. Thank you for this uh, frank answer. And the next question I have is to Pavel Golosov. Amazon has developed a personnel recruiting system and as a white male were the employees that were mostly selected for this particular company in the past, the system tried to follow this pattern. But how can we teach AI and algorithms if we do not know what is, is embedded there? Because if we train them on the previous experiment, we just uh, stick all the clones and bias and prejudice. So then if we use these technologies, how can we implement the principles of uh, 
fairity and uh, equalness, uh, how should we abandon uh, AI um, just reproducing our patterns? What will I receive if I answer the question that is unanswerable? Proceeding from the experience I have and uh, communication with the people that develop this in this country, I have never come across uh, examples when training neural networks uh, or solving some tasks, uh, good results were reached. I will talk about behavioral, not neuromedicine here. Uh, I have never seen uh, fully going away from uh, some historic patterns and uh, that can be said about uh, judicial uh, sphere and civil service uh, there are always some artifacts that show that uh, the system has been uh, trained the network has been trained uh, on uh, patterns on examples that are not truly correct and then it reproduces uh, them and uh, the effect was uh, somehow so large that uh, they had to switch off these algorithms and work without them. So I don't think that we would be able to come up with uh, any solutions uh, that uh, would enable us to implement uh, fair principles if these fair principles are not implemented in non-digital world. I believe that so far we can agree only on the limit of degradation in terms of transparency, freedom, equality that would be accessible. And uh, linked to that, uh, Maria, I would like to try to ask the following questions. Digital technologies introduction, does it mean that a person is seeking overcoming a lie. So do we pose uh, this ethical task uh, to the digital that uh, the world should uh, have less lies? And will it be a marker of uh, what we're heading to? We can ask the audience, yes, to vote now. So who thinks that generally the society, so how will we word the question? And we will ask the people to raise their hands. So will you expect of digital technologies introduction that interaction of you with other citizens, with the government, with business would have a downscale of lies and would increase the transparency, the logic that we have been discussing. Are we ready to confess uh, to ourselves uh, not being true and uh, demand that from all those around it? So vote for yourselves personally. Do you personally expect or would you like to see this? And do you connect uh, digital technologies uh, possibilities and uh, the franker world, more truthful world. And I will ask a sociologist to word the question. There are four different questions here. I believe we need to start with ourselves. Yes, let us break it down at least uh, into two questions. So first, do you think that technologies can become a tool to reach truth, to reach the truth? And the second question, do you think uh, that uh, being that kind of tool, technologies can change uh, the present situation and make uh, processes uh, more accessible and transparent? Regrettably, interpretation without the microphone is impossible. A great question to the audience. Another one. Do you think that uh, people need all the truth? 
You did not uh, manage to word your question in 10 seconds, uh, so you have not passed uh, the pitch and the lift test. Try to word your question better. You see, we all have to do that. And my next question is to Alexei Gorobtsov, and uh, it coincides with this question. So you are responsible for super services now, that is a large area of comprehensive uh, digital uh, services, uh, civil services. Uh, for example, when a child, uh, when a baby is born today, people used to go to different authorities and now they can get it uh, in one point, uh, like a single window. In India, they also have uh, services of this kind. And when services are taken to the digital uh, without uh, having analog options like in India they do. Very often, if uh, there is not internet, no internet connection, people cannot get to this service. And we faced it as well. For example, we elaborated a mobile app for a large event and we did not even think that uh, people uh, that uh, come to this event uh, might uh, have uh, certain eyesight uh, disabilities. So we did not think about that, and we had one person like that, and uh, that made us uh, start thinking about it uh, for the future. So what about uh, access? Do we need uh, to have both digital and analog options? Uh, how should we act? Do you have a couple of minutes? I will just uh, give you my personal example. We take services uh, digital ourselves and we use a lot of them. And uh, once uh, I faced uh, getting this digital service for myself uh, personally, and it is clear that uh, not many people will uh, study all the regulations and rules before they go to get a service. And I had a look at them and then went to the civil services uh, portal and uh, I applied for registration of uh, f f for the place where I live. And I applied in such a way that I had to reapply three times. So the system allowed uh, me to apply that uh, in the way that was not correct, uh, to use uh, the service center that I was not allowed to use. And after a long correspondence, they told me, now you can physically go to this uh, multifunctional service center. So I went there. I understood that I had uh, sent all the documents. Uh, and I asked the owner of the flat. Uh, and at an agreed uh, time, we were at this center. We entered uh, the office. Uh, and uh, then the employee there was looking at my documents and uh, said, where is uh, the document uh, that proves that your children uh, have the place of living, uh, the previous pr place of living? And uh, I told her, I have uh, given all the documents. Uh, and she said, no, I need the paper with the red stamp. And I said, well, I am not sure that I have it at all. And she said, no, you cannot get the service without that. OK, I go back uh, home. I find uh, this uh, size uh, piece of paper with this red stamp. Uh, I wonder that uh, I have not lost it. I go back to this uh, multifunction service center. The employee checks uh, it all again. And then she says, I will give the documents to my head, to my director, and then uh, you will be called. She goes there, gives him all the documents. Then they have a lunch break for one hour. So I spend this hour somewhere nearby with my wife, with the kids. So there are a lot of us, and uh, we are already nervous. And the owner of the flat is there as well. So an hour passes, and then this director calls us looks at me, looks at the owner, and says, give me the paper, the document uh, that you own this flat. Uh, he says, now we do not have uh, the paper that we used to have. Uh, there is just uh, some uh, certificate. He says, OK, give me this certificate. 
But we ask him, how come you are a multifunctional center? And he says, okay, would you like us to do it now in seven days? And uh, I just uh, keep wondering why seven, not uh, five, as it is said in the rules, and why hadn't you done it before? So again, no document. And now we go to the owner of the flat's place, find the document that they have there, go back to the multifunctional service center, then they have another break there. And it's good that I'm a calm person and I did not uh, just uh, finish off somebody there. So finally, I receive four paper documents, uh, this size uh, approximately as well, with other red stamps. And now I keep them safe. And this year, when I received it once again, when 12 months uh, have passed, I was totally ready for this all, and uh, it took us two hours to receive it all. So what am I driving at? That is not the way it should be. No matter whether we provide a digital or an analog service, what I face, what I faced was a, a true headache. And now we are saying that uh, we are elaborating super services uh, with great names and the idea is great. We will do it, yes. And it will be a digital input, but uh, not only the input, but also the output uh, changes. We cannot switch off analog completely because uh, Yes, there are people that uh, do not uh, have the internet access, uh, that do not use the internet, that uh, are not accustomed to the internet, uh, do not trust it. I believe uh, three or more generations have to change uh, before we would be able to go digital. Yes, clear, FinTech and uh, Avier travel, no, Airflot does not give uh, the certificate about uh, the travel when you lose uh, the boarding pass. Well, at least we can buy uh, tickets uh, and use QR codes uh, without printing the ticket itself, but not everybody uses that. Still, there are desks where the tickets are printed out. So these uh, options, uh, optionability, so to say, is still present. And the difference is that there are people that uh, would like uh, to do it digitally. They will apply for something as fast as uh, they can, and they can get it uh, online in a couple of seconds. But there are other people that would like to physically go somewhere, like multifunctional service center. And the new law, by the way, uh, stipulates uh, that uh, only multifunctional service center will be left uh, and no other offices of uh, governmental services. But the person will have to be able to get the service fast without uh, going from one person to another for hours. Just uh, the lady that will receive uh, the documents uh, will uh, make digital copies of them quickly and uh, the person will receive what they need. So when we understand that everybody is ready technologically and mentally to that, we would be able to close the second analog door that might happen to 2040. And now that is a Mentimeter. So all those who have smartphones, please uh, register there, so go to www.menti.com and use the code that you can see on the screen, 945283. So please go there to register. And I had a short question that I didn't ask in the first round. Alexei, what values do you think the government should protect while regulating digital economy, at least in your part? Because you are the third person from the minister, if we come from the minister, in charge of digital project. So what values, as a representative of the state, will you protect? First of all, data protection and uh, privacy protection, I believe, will be the first thing. And second, no matter what sphere we work in, the result and the value of the result uh, is a high-quality service. 
Okay, privacy and uh, convenience. The questions that uh, the audience is now voting for. So the question that uh, asked that has the most votes is whether it is uh, timely to have the questions of ethics and digital technology options of answers early. We will learn uh, on the mistakes of others. Second, early. First, we need to develop digital technologies. Next, uh, it's uh, high time. Point four, it's already late. Uh, this train cannot be stopped. And uh, the last uh, option, it's useless. Uh, no one will pay attention to ethics if we talk about super high income. People believe that it's high time we started the discussion. The second spot is it's too early. Let's have some achievements in the development of digital technologies. I'm going to ask you to comment on the results of the survey. Kirill? It's high time we started discussion of the question. It is absolutely right. And the majority is quite clear about the answer. It is just a part of the question and a part of our discussion. From my standpoint, it is very important to mention what Ilya has stated, that the technologies themselves are going to change, and the content of the discussion is going to change as well. For example, as of today, we don't have any level of the technologies allowing for digitalization for our life. And we cannot see the digital world right now. That's what we are talking about. We're saying that we can be transparent, but we're not totally transparent so far. We're saying that there may be some technologies which are going to scan our organism. We are afraid of that. We don't have any trust since there are no technologies in place. When the technologies emerge, we are going to trust some of them. We are going to accept some of them. As of today, we understand. Then when we are able to scan and process the information, uh, so in the pill with a chip, which is going to provide information on our state of uh, and health of condition in our digestion system, is going to give information about our health through water or food products. We're going to have the information about our health condition is going to be provided either to a physician or artificial intelligence, we are going to start believing that, trusting that. We believe that uh, daily monitoring will allow us to get to know about serious illnesses or diseases. And we're going to have a trust, and we're going to a different agenda compared with today. It's evident that the results are quite reasonable. We have some things to discuss. In the future, we're going to have some things to discuss as well. But the subject is going to be different. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question. We're going to have this next question to answer, not to wait for the results of the discussion. The next question which we ask, which language will we be talked about the ethics by the artificial intelligence? English, Chinese, German, Russian, Japanese? Is going to be any breakthrough by Japan, or is not going to talk to us as it is not interested in us at all? I'm going to ask Alexander, what is your option? Is not going to talk to us. Being a representative of Huawei, I probably thought you would be for Chinese. But more people believe that English is the way forward. Many believe that the Russian is going to 20 to believe that nobody is going to talk to us at all. Valeria, what is your opinion? You know, we have kind of a swamp. We are just moving aside from the ethics issue. I cannot just keep my words to myself. At least you can speak Russian right now. What is uh, artificial intelligence? You know, a long time ago, the philosopher was linguistic abilities created a speculative term. Nobody understands what artificial intelligence is. Many people have what is strong intelligence is, but it has nothing to do with what the current science has about artificial intelligence and 
robotics. Please do not abuse this term, which has nothing behind. Secondly, there are some questions connected with trust, transparency, whether it is possible to deceive, what is going to happen to truth or to lie. We shouldn't discuss that. The work is really going on. Now it is at the level of the technological regulations. There are boring documents which are called technical standards. IAAA and complicated standards are being developed. Our national team working on the development of the standards. We, being humanitarians, can elaborate on that at length. But the document should say which features the system should have in order to provide for transparency, for trust. There are some documents connected with the fake news generation. There are technical standards, I would like to reiterate, which define the impartiality issues, empathy issues. Why should we talk about only humanitarian comprehension of all those issues. We need to discuss a different thing by constantly moving from ethics issues to in particular legal issues, legal making issues. You know, the privacy issue of data is not about the ethics. It's about the legal issue. If it is prohibited by the law, there is nothing to do with ethics. We should be more reasonable approaching these terms, Valeri, what is out of those regulations, out of the standards, what are the most important for you, which should be accepted, which are going to resolve all these issues? They do not resolve the issues, they define the features which, which should be possessed by the system. If we stipulate the problems of impartiality, it shouldn't be black box itself. That the solution made by the system, it should be interpreted. How are we going to interpret? This is a different question. But there is intellectual system making decision, important for a person. It should explain why. So the developers of the standards don't say about the mechanisms. The standards exist for different purpose. There is no explanation. There is no trust. It is about the market. If you enter the market with the software, which would be called intellectual system, and there is a label that this complies with the ethical standard of the regulation. This is purely about commercialization. It is very important for the business, for the production. And as for the importance of standards, this is the standard about the explanation of the decision or solution. We shouldn't have the case when a neural network made a wrong decision because it had uh, bad data. This is just uh, a wrong application of the system. Neural network should exist for a different purpose. If it cannot explain, it doesn't matter whether it is a, a neural network or if it is a data, big data analysis, correlation, or different formulas, it doesn't matter. This is not about the result. If there is no explanation why you should accept this female instead of male, you shouldn't have compliance with the standards. It's quite simple as that. Thank you very much for your answer. This is a very decent answer to what is going to happen, but let's be more mundane. Let's see what happened with the question we asked. I'd like to ask another question. I would like to ask the audience. Let's raise our hands. Can you imagine that you, for example, did order some food delivery? You have some soup without necessary ingredients. You just made a complaint to this service. Then you have a restaurant calling you. You know, I'm sorry. We're going to have you the required soup you wanted and a cake in addition to that. Who is going to say yes? That's it. Please keep your hand raised. And now um, may we ask you a question. Can you delete your feedback, please? 
I deleted feedback. You know? Everybody wouldn't just delete your order for the cake? Let's go and eat that cake, you know? we not so many in our audience. This question about the uh, fairness. If it is anonymous, many more people will go for that option, deleting your feedback. You know, it's very, it's a very difficult real world. Is it ethical to uh, speak bad words to uh, a vacuum cleaner or to a navigator in the presence of a child? No, you sh should be more restrained. You shouldn't use bad words. No, you should just speak bad language to each other only. Who? say bad words to robotics, to navigators in the presence of a child. See how many who can comment on that. We have a different perspective. Can you imagine that you have intellectual autonomous system which understands different modalities, uh, different meanings? You know, to swear is useful. Additional information, additional narrative to your story. The intellectual system. S we had an experiment on a real communication. There was a different task. Actually, there was a, robo a robot which was said what to do. And the question was to set new tasks. And when you talk in a respected way, could you please find then something It started to deal with its own issues with this modality when then there was impolite modality. Of course, we didn't swear much, but this is quite a real good example. If you want to prioritize the task, you start swearing or giving the, your own assessment that the robot is not right. You know, it's everything is quite good from the technical point of view, you know, for robot for robot vacuum cleaner for voice recognition this is data the more data it has the smarter it become becomes and the recognition system works much better following the order here we have a child as a background and then the question is not about the robot is how we behave ourselves in the context the particular context which we actually got used before any technologies emerged. And I can see a different answer, actually, not connected with technologies at all. In fact, there is another story, which is not about digital technologies, but about generations living with all these technologies. One of the colleagues had a very funny story. They bought Alisa, Yandex assistant, unpacked, switched on, and didn't have time time to adjust. Six years. Kit just adjusted to its own voice and blocked. And now they ask, can you block it out? Can, no, you just should ask me if you need some music. I would ask Alisa to play the music. You know, this is kind of human interface. So the six years old child decided to be an intermediary all the time. Whether you swear or not, the quits are going to be fast switching it to the human interface and use it as a resource, actually. We should ask what is going to. Maybe there is even some kind of fee to use Alisa. This is an entrepreneur thinking, way of thinking. This is a good thing. Next question, E records, registries, control, di uh, registers. We are always under the control of the technologies. So what are the social problems which may emerge due to the proliferation of digital technologies? Can anything be done with that? I'm going to give you another example. I read 
kind of survey that kids uh, become adults faster when the parents publish their photos in the internet till the 10 or 13 years old their whole life has been in the spotlight so what are we to expect from the future you know it is not a social problem connected with other social issues we're going to face generation differences with respect to different applications of technologies, those who live in the age of technologies as the interaction norm with electronic system going to be accepted in one way or going to be accepted in different way by different generations. We should speak about not about the problems faced by a particular user, but what we miss when we imagine the world of the future. It's not going to be instant. Nobody is going to have one set of rules and norms. That was mentioned already at the beginning of our discussion. When we don't have good processes of interaction with the state are going to be in deteriorate. The major problem connected with the digitalization is that we don't understand yet which social inequality issues, the access to the technologies in view of regional problems, mostly connected with the current social problems, which are going to deteriorate to a bigger extent. And the solutions are not going to emerge on the technological level. They should be at the managerial level or at the higher digital literacy among the population in general. So these are the issues connected with different things. What are two major social problems which we're going to face? The inequality in the access to the technologies. And as for Russia, this is the infrastructure. technological infrastructure, for example, regional multifunctional center, we should be good at serving the local stand center, is going to be good at it, since the li digital literacy at low level, and it is impossible to have additional outreach activity to increase the digital literacy among the population, therefore the problem is going to emerge and it's going to deteriorate and regional authorities will have to face this problem and tackle this problem. But this is more about the methodological approach to the further development. There is another aspect which brings us back to what Valery has mentioned. Whether we should consider the dilemma of privacy and security, which is connected with the ethical issue, since at the end of the day, it is at the backbone of the technological decision-making process. Where is going to be the borderline between this set of data we are ready to provide in order to provide for this national security or not? So this is the question. It's about cultural aspect. Singapore, which has been mentioned already, where we have social so-called of consent, where I give the maximum set of data and you take maximum uh, care of me, is not going to be actually the case for Russia or for a bigger country because of the cultural and behavioral patterns. We should get back to the values and make decisions, technological decisions, digital decisions based on the values where we agree on and these are in shortage. You're saying that we will have the opportunity to uh, decide whether we go going to share the set of data about ourselves. It's kind of, you know, uh, uh, gu not guilty until proven to the contrary concept. Ilya, 
Pavel, can you comment on that, please? In 2017, in Toronto, Canada, they decided to launch a smart city with Google. In 2019, Toronto citizens changed their mind and they decided that they couldn't believe Amazon, Google, and Facebook. There were some scandals connected with the ethics of data. So the citizens didn't believe Google, but who rather than big, large corporations can make the cities smarter? In our case, this is Ross Telecom, Wilpicom, Megaphone companies turning our cities into smart cities, working on the projects of smart cities with different administrations. How can you find the balance between that to for the interests of citizens, states, and the companies? Will smart cities be like they are described right now? If it is the case, who is going to be provider and owner of the data? And how can you find the balance? Before answering your question, I would like uh, to thank you, Maria, and uh, those uh, colleagues uh, who were involved uh, into the report, because of the report and uh, words of practical, all of them start myself thinking the following. So first, the first question is the, that you ask whether we or somebody else will do it. Uh, that is not a question that uh, is present. You remember when uh, there is a fox uh, and a crow on uh, a branch, uh, and the fox is uh, hugging the crow, and it doesn't know whether to give out the cheese or not. So that is non-existent. The second question, in terms of ethics, understanding, and so on, one of the most complicated questions and tasks that we now have is connected with psychology. And when you are communicating on the Internet, uh, it's hard to determine whether you are communicating with a human being or with a chatbot. And that is a very difficult uh, task. You might uh, not even understand that you are communicating with a machine because algorithms are becoming more and more complicated. Therefore, we need psychologists to discuss this topic because machine starts adapting to your psychotype. It will not speak with everyone in the same manner. The example that we heard about public services and when the person, as he said, was very calm and he did not go to kill anybody here, though I would act differently. So this example shows that psychotypes of different people are different. And uh, even among us uh, sitting here, there is not a single absolutely, absolutely identical person to another one. And uh, that depends on how speech structures are formed. And uh, it is true that if a machine cannot explain what it has done, it will just uh, end on it. And uh, what we mainly have now are these things, but uh, that is more of a deadlock. So as for the first idea, I believe that uh, the current world uh, will be named uh, in history as digital hike, uh, as a digital archaic. So we are now in digital archaic before entering the new world. And proceeding from the report and driving a certain conclusion, what comes to the foreground is uh, the question of digital sovereignty, not globally speaking of countries, but personal digital sovereignty. Because when we are communicating with uh, neighboring person, there is a certain comfort area that is okay for me within one meter or two. If uh, that person gets closer than this comfort zone, I feel uncomfortable. Now, think that uh, all these digital technologies uh, touch upon the question of sovereignty of myself as a personality. And then we have to talk about uh, sovereignty of the city. We had an example of Seattle. Sovereignty of the country. And uh, then 
killing sovereignty, I believe, uh, means uh, killing uh, development. So unification kills uh, development. A couple of years ago, for example, the key story was a blockchain. And when we tried to explain that uh, this technology was known since the 1970s, and that is a deadlock that is just degrading. It should not be omni-used. Very often, there are just uh, two options of an answer, yes, no, with no shades. That is where it can be used. But if you use it everywhere, it just kills development. And so we have to say that uh, digital sovereignty is development. The world uh, is great uh, in its diversity, diversity of people, nations. And I believe that the mission of Russia, that is the term that we have to use, I believe, is that we as a country, we as a nation, have learned to survive and adapt to different knowledge, religions, ethnicities, languages, and we have to now export digital sovereignty, both personal and public. So we can call the second part digital sovereignty, beginning of history. And now a couple of interesting facts that uh, are critical in 2020 and uh, at uh, Gaidar Economic Forum. On the 2nd uh, of uh, January, it was 120 years uh, anniversary of Isaac Asimov's uh, birthday, who was from Russia as well. And it is 2020, if I'm not mistaken, in line with uh, Kondratiev's, uh, economist Kondratiev's uh, assessment uh, is uh, economic uh, cycle, new economic cycle beginning. So a combination of all these things, the fact that we start thinking and discussing one of the most complex uh, things connected with ethics is about it. And. Uh, Coming up to an end, uh, I would like uh, to use some humor because uh, ideas uh, that uh, were connected uh, with using slang for changing algorithms, I put it down here. So we will uh, come up with uh, some algorithms that will just change the machine. Because in Russian, we can do so. And I would. You will need to recognize the shades there because uh, very short phrases uh, can be used to talk about uh, many nuances. Yes, and I would like uh, to give you an example that uh, I was told in December. One uh, friend of mine, when we started discussing uh, digital technologies, said uh, that uh, keyboard Alice and uh, his wife and him uh, were discussing a movie, Dilda, and uh, a kid uh, came up uh, to Alice, and as uh, the speech was young, not so uh, great, and said, Alice, Dilda, and Alice showed something that shocked uh, the kid uh, and the parents, but that is not, uh, that was not ended on it uh, because uh, Yandex uh, is a pretty dumb company and uh, the, sec the next couple of weeks uh, was uh, connected with the advertisements of porno sites. So the matter of ethics is uh, really critical and uh, the matter of digital sovereignty is uh, at the forefront today. And we have to think about our own uh, sovereignty and uh, also the country's and the world's sovereignty. So as far as I understand, uh, so far in our president's uh, address, uh, there are two main topics, demographics in the country and the internet. So it might be combined finally. Pavel, as Ilya has already voiced a joke, I would like to say that in the last question that we had, 10% of the audience 
are already ready for the vengeance. So the phase of Robert's humanization has been lived through by us and we are ready to act with them the way they act with us. Ilya, you talked about uh, fantastics and uh, yeah, it's good to talk about Isaac Asimov and his Russian roots, though he wrote in uh, English and uh, science fiction that uh, connected with that is like Asimov is a Chinese today. So my advice to you would be to have a look uh, at uh, that because the Chinese uh, science fiction is uh, similar to Asimov's. I have not uh, read it. Uh, I will do it with pleasure. I might uh, seem not trendy, but I do not believe in China at all. I do not believe in China as a nation. Are there other opinions in the audience? So that is uh, where development and diversity is manifested. Do I have a mic, handheld mic? Could you give it to the person in the audience uh, so that we can hear something about China from them? Selzy, three bodies. Give the mic, please. Don't uh, be afraid. We have all been checked with our badges. I do not belong to the Chinese, as uh, you understand. But as a representative of Huawei, I can say that uh, now the most number of patents in ICT is those of uh, Huawei, and uh, the largest investment is there as well. I believe that uh, we in Russia have to just accept that and try to move like that. Yes, the longest wall is theirs as well, but uh, where is it built? On what side? I'm for Yuri because Russian programmers uh, work in Huawei, so that is Russian intelligence. Uh, and if you pay 20,000, Huawei pays 500,000. And uh, have a look at uh, the Chinese wall. They have been rebuilding it uh, for 500 years. Uh, it uh, was built uh, in the reverse. So it is all based on another thing. Uh, and uh, they have changed the language. So please, uh, let's not start a diplomatic scandal at international forum. So if Russian programmers work for the Chinese, I believe that uh, we will uh, have the situation like with uh, Azimov, that uh, all the glory will not go to us. Kirill, a question to you. And please uh, leave some time for Q&A session with the audience. I was already scolded at uh, today for the term strong uh, AI, though in our report we decipher it and uh, we say that it is just a trendy term. But still, how far do you think we can forecast the development of digital technologies today? And we as a people and uh, public institutions, uh, not talking about corporation now, so we as society or countries, will we maintain control over digital technologies or not? And how will we live with that? So, you know, so far, we are not talking about uh, far-fetched uh, time. And in the near years and decades, uh, it is obvious that a lot of things uh, will go to singularity. And uh, the machines uh, will do something better than the humans. Uh, just as the easiest CNI lathe does uh, something better than uh, human beings. Uh, that is this singularity. And uh, the governments will also reach this singularity because a lot of uh, services will be digitized and uh, 
this uh, will happen when we start trusting technologies and uh, by 2030s this will happen with uh, digital transportation as well when we understand that it is much safer and uh, the networks will uh, not be 5G but 6G already and to that extent well I believe uh, that uh, technologies will still remain useful and more useful to the human beings more effective but uh, the humans will not lose uh, the lever of uh, control because uh, a huge trend in digital technology development is that uh, the present digital economy will be substituted uh, by something else when it reaches uh, heights and uh, powers uh, when uh, people will uh, be able to have uh, personalized uh, food uh, personalized health care when uh, it all will go to analytics of our ideas emotions so that is a long-term perspective but that is again something that will help us uh, have our life better we should not be afraid of AI because that is something that we create develop and control so in conclusion what I deem critical in the perspective of 2020s. The world in the 21st century has acquired a very important feature. It learned to, to adapt to us. In the 20th century, it did not happen. Makarevich sang back then, let the world adapt to us, but it did not happen. And now it does happen. And we all have said that people are different, opinions are different, and uh, attitude to ethics, uh, privacy, and data are different. So in the near future, technologies and governments have to learn this all and have to come up with the customized, the tailor-made solutions. So we should go away from one-size-fits-all approach and uh, all these uh, stories uh, will uh, be replaced by customized uh, stories and solutions. Would you like to disclose your data? Have you signed uh, your user agreement? Then you can use this data, you can obtain this service, but you will run the respective risks as well. If you do not, uh, then you will not get it. And that will reach uh, public activities as well. And a huge role will be played here by the change of generation in management. Because even in the countries, uh, generations uh, were changed greatly. The last one uh, was in the 1990s when uh, we had uh, this uh, change uh, in uh, management uh, of companies and the country when uh, people of 40 came uh, to management positions and I believe that uh, this uh, generation change will take place in the 2020s as well and people with a different uh, mindset uh, in their 30s or 40s will rule the legislative uh, process the development of software and uh, managing companies. These will be people of a different generation. So this generation will change uh, like uh, material value consumers to content consumers uh, change took place. Our generation was a generation that uh, made money uh, and earned money. Now we see the generation that uh, earns likes. And this change will uh, change and reconsider the attitude to ethics. Thank you very much. Lilia had uh, some comment on the previous uh, previous uh, words, and uh, I will ask uh, the panelists uh, to look through the questions uh, to select uh, one that you would like to answer. No, you should not uh, answer vacuum cleaner robots. Well, I had a comment on Chinese question that we had and I believe that that is first of all connected with uh, the fact that we are trying to have our cultural views more diverse while considering ethics because 
one of the recent uh, recommendations of IEEE is that uh, when we develop digital technologies, we have to consider not only Western world uh, values, but uh, other different uh, concepts of humankind. So I don't think that we should ignore China so that uh, the questions that are posed to developers have to consider and take uh, in mind this. Thank you very much. Alexei, please uh, select the question. May I answer a question connected with the professional philosophers? There was another discussion in the forum connected with the philosophical re-understanding of the state role. Unfortunately, the program changed, and I do hope to see the discussion a bit later, not at the forum at least. I wanted to talk about that matter from different angles about the prospects development of the digital signature. We have digital discrimination. Digital signature is going to stay with us. There are two directions. The first one the signature is going to be in our new passport for offline interaction. It's not very convenient to take that to get the signature right now, but the question is going to be resolved. For online interaction, there's going to be a cloud cap. You're not going to adjust your system to anything different. It's going to be a cloud cap attached to your profile. And through that, you'll be able to communicate and interact with the state. So, Lilia, select the question. But I may give you a spoiler. Seldom William Company is called, is named after William Seldom. I'm going to elaborate on the question with the ethical question is more uh, pressing with in the, case, in, in the age of technological development. This is the position of socially vulnerable groups which do not fit into the system due to some standards. There was an example about those people who are hard of hearing or seeing. You know, in fact, there are more social groups like that from the generation divide to those physically disabled people. These are micro groups, minorities in different meanings which are not considered due to some reasons when we develop these technologies. Apart from the standards, there are some current standards and there are some recommendations aimed at balancing the standards in view of diversity of people in the society. And half of these standards over 2019-2018 at least which stipulate the state of AI and how connected with the interaction with these vulnerable groups, with the experts engaged in social work, philosophers, psychologists, all those people who can give the diversity to these standards. You know, answering the question why we have different colors now interactive compared with the real world, the colleague said that uh, you know, inclusive design for those who are hard of seeing. That's why the frame is blue. You know, I have a dream. Next time I'd like to have a discussion when the audience can give scores to speakers. If, for example, you have more time if the audience approves of what you're saying, if the audience is bored, so we need to limit the time for a speaker. Of course, we need 
to add up the feature where you go down through the floor if you are not liked by the audience or just erase the speaker at all. You know, Valery, you probably would have half of the time of our section. Thank you very much for all your contribution. You know, it's, I'm happy to hear such a comment. I'm going to be brief on some questions. You know, polygraphic and the liar detector machine is not whether we can say that person lies or not, whether we understand whether the person has something to hide. This is a more important question, whether it is ethical or not. You know, all the studies made on the people who are mandatory participants of the procedure, you know, you know, it's not about ethics, it's about the instructions inside some units, what has been touched. We didn't talk, unfortunately, about how intellectual system can make a decision which we need to call ethical. This is the question of questions. So the implications of digital technologies are great, but this is not the technical issue. This is mostly humanitarian issue. Can you imagine how you're going to train the robot to make a decision when the technical restraints and constraints do not work, when the legal limitations are not in place? If we should follow the law, there is nothing to do about that. We don't have a choice. When this post system do not work, there is a question whether your decision is ethical based on your values, what is good, what is bad. There's nothing to be left. The last edge, which we called the set of values. How can we embed all the information into the machine? This is a question of questions. Unfortunately, we're not trying to answer this question. What has been touched upon yet? Robots dictating their own ethics, and what is the robot's vacuum cleaner when I present it, you know, my just spouse said that we cannot have it anymore, they are doing the things, it is loud, switching off instantly, they need to give up everything and to deal with the robot, you know, it's kind of manipulation of people by the robot, dictating their ethics, you know, in robotics there is a special area that through joint efforts the robot should solve tasks. It has been in place for many years, but the results haven't been achieved yet. Then the paradigm emerged and when the robot is trained to find joint solutions, when they will, when they are able to educate society, and when we have a society, there is not only a rule of interaction, there are some issues of ethics, as ethics is considered as a way to resolve conflicts. And in this case, this cultural society of robots are going to act and behave differently depending on the interactive algorithms embedded in them. This is a very interesting thing and very perspective one. You know, I believe that uh, we are going to see the situation when robots are going to dictate their own will. Pavel? I saw one question to me in how many years? We're going to see the amended law in the individual uh, regarding individuals. Probably we're going to duplicate the foreign experience how autonomous vehicles are going to use. We're going to analyze how it is going to happen there and then to duplicate the experience with our own constraints. I cannot say about particular years, it's going to be two, three years lag from the world experience. I'll be brief on three questions. First question, see the difference among the people. I, I've asked you just to select one question. Everybody keeps on saying that I'm going to answer three questions. You know, there, there has been a precedent already. 
I'll be brief. Talking about the hacker attacks and the hacker crimes. I believe that they're going to exist even longer compared with the offline, as the offline crimes are going to die out due to technologies. When the big wars became just not reasonable, when the nuclear weapon emerged, when the technologies appear which allow to detect those terrorist attacks, and this is the case for the future, definitely. These offline crimes are going to be not reasonable at all. But hacking attacks are going to stay with us for a little bit longer. And there were two other questions. Why are there more talks about the ethics and technologies concerns rather than emotions? As we don't have enough users, as we don't have enough users, particular technology, there is a concern. Whenever there are users, whenever they grow in number, there is a talk about the ethics of using this technology when we are going to have a lot of users. So the concern will disappear. If it is not the case, the technology will not exist at all. And the second question in this respect, are we going to have the mass chip embedding in the population? No, it's not going to be the case, since this is the old understanding. We're going to shift to a different way of getting data as has been imagined as a chip embedding in the population. We're going to have a more comfortable and convenient way of getting data from him or her. In brief, I do not agree with your understanding of a fear. Fear emerges when you don't understand anything. When you start to understand, the fear disappears. As of today, many people don't understand what the technology is. Therefore, the fear emerges. And then I can remember the old saying that 2% of the people think, 3% think that they think, and 95% will die rather than think. This is the conventional case. Whether the psychology will change, if you take the person out of the environment and put him into the environment with other people, he's going to change. But the question is whether it is going to be changed for the better or for the worse. And the internet control, the current format, I would answer yes, as it is connected with the security. And it is quite political question. May, may I scroll down a little bit? Why don't I believe in China? Because I believe in Russia. That's all. We need to wrap up. I'd like to thank all those who participated in our discussion, all the authors and experts of the report. The report can be downloaded through the link. Our Center for the principle of free access to our materials, we do welcome the proliferation of materials. Please have the link for the people to get acquainted with our directed version of the report. Let's thank all the speakers and thank you very much for your active participation.